Uh, Minister Araujo, good to see you again. Um, my question is, is that uh, is about Brazil's position in international climate negotiations um, and the issue of sustainability. Uh, Boeing recently has reaffirmed its commitment to sustainability, particularly uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, we've announced that our aircraft by 2030 will be 100% uh, compliant and capable of handling sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, our, all of our manufacturing and, and footprint was net carbon zero last year, and we're heavily invested in ensuring that the aviation industry itself meets our goals, um, driving forward on, on CO2 emissions reductions. And so my question is, as Brazil, as you think about Brazil's position in international climate negotiations and carbon markets, do you view a role for aviation biofuels as part of that discussion? Thanks. Thank you, Jason, and uh, thank you, uh, Landon, for the uh, for the question. So, uh, biofuels, uh, biofuels in general, uh, both more uh, first generation or uh, second generation or aviation biofuels. This can be uh, a part of an excellent uh, package for the uh, environment and, and climate negotiations uh, across the world, and Brazil can be a strong contributor to that. Uh, we can th can see, I think, three uh, dimensions to that uh, sort of package. One, from our point of view, of course, is the uh, the national determined contribution that Brazil made late last year, uh, which was quite uh, ambitious to the uh, to the Paris Agreement. One, S two, uh, the uh, the question of financing that we need to improve. We need to deliver on the Article Six of the Paris Agreement, and we need to. Uh, well, actually, we didn't live to uh, the. Um, didn't deliver to the um, to the Kyoto <laughs> Agreement uh, before, but uh, there is immense room for uh, constructive uh, talks and constructive results uh, on Article Six and other solutions. Uh, today, I was with uh, President Bolsonaro. We were um, preparing uh, his address to uh, a meeting of the IDB that will praise the IDB for creating a, a new uh, bioeconomy fund, which was. Brazil's uh, idea back in 2019, and now this is taking place. Uh, in order to uh, transform all the, uh, the talk about the, uh, uh, the environment, which is, uh, of course, great, uh, it's a worldwide concern, of course, but to transform that into uh, a, uh, a con concrete result in terms of private investment uh, to deliver jobs and sustainable uh, solutions for the people. And the third, the bioeconomy, including uh, biofuels. Uh, and that Brazil can be a, a contributor with technology. We have the best biofuels technology uh, in the world. We can partner with the U.S. We have tried that in the past. We can, we can try that again. Uh, there's immense promise for uh, all kinds of biofuels uh, to the whole world. So um, with that, we can uh, bilaterally or with whatever uh, format uh, create uh, a strong package uh, for the environment, for climate this year. Uh, with Brazil as a strong uh, actor in that. We're having bilateral talks with the uh, U.S., of course, with Secretary Kerry, but also with the U.K. as uh, presidency of the COP. So uh, we see a lot of promise in uh, th this whole agenda, and particularly in biofuels. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Capricia Marshall, uh, all the friends at the um, Atlantic Council, especially the uh, Adrian Arst Center, uh, Dr. Fred Camp, Jason uh, Martzak, all the uh, um, foreign ministers uh, here uh, present, my dear colleagues and friends uh, from Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay, uh, other friends that I uh, recognized from the, uh, the previous uh, discussion, Paula Dobriansky, Lennon Loomis, uh, Gabriel Trebat, uh, so many uh, friends from uh, my time in Washington. So um, 30 years ago, when we uh, when the heads of state of uh, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay gathered in Asuncion to uh, establish the Mercosul. The uh, world was uh, witnessing the triumph uh, of liberal democracies and free markets over state-driven economies and totalitarian societies. Similarly, Mercosul was born from the commitment of uh, four freely elected leaders to overcome decades of unsuccessful protectionist economic policies imposed in the region. When our country signed the Treaty of Asuncion, we recognized that democracy, free trade, and openness to the world were key to the prosperity and well-being of our citizens. Political and economic freedom are principles ingrained in Mercosul's DNA. Those are premises that inspire Brazil's current efforts to provide 
the, and help the regional integration project attain a renewed thrust. I would like to take this opportunity to talk specifically about how Brazil perceives Mercosul after these 30 years. First, it's important to stress that uh, we uh, see a primacy of democracy in our integration project. And in that sense, uh, let me uh, mention an issue that we cannot swipe under the carpet. Mercosur has a fifth member, uh, and this fifth member, uh, Venezuela, is absent today. Four years uh, since its suspension for breach of the democratic commitment, that country has yet to meet the conditions for being welcomed, welcomed back into the group. Venezuela is a sister nation, dear to all of us, which belongs here with us. As soon as Venezuelans take their country back from the gang that rules it by force, intimidation, and humiliation of their own people. Mercosul can be, and hopefully will soon be in the near future, an instrument to reintegrate Venezuela, a free Venezuela, into the world. Mercosul's commitment to democracy, which is a binding contractual commitment, was present at, it, at its inception, and for Brazil it remains a central tenet now. The suspension of Venezuela for violating that contract shows that in Mercosur we take democracy fully seriously. It is sometimes stated that the question of uh, Venezuela is an ideological one, and that different approaches to Venezuela are ideological, and this is not the case. Uh, I personally have repeated many times, democracy is not an ideology. The fight for human dignity against organized crime is not ideological. Um, we cannot ignore the real threats to democracy in our region, and uh, uh, we, cannot either, uh, to, we cannot replace sound economic policy by, uh, by slogans, which can sound good, but will not uh, help us address our real problems, will not attract investment, will not create jobs, and will not modernize uh, our economies. One uh, interesting comparison to be made is between Mercosul and uh, ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries, for example. If you look at uh, where we were uh, back in 1991 and where we are now, we see that um, ASEAN performed much better than our countries. Uh, basically, we think, uh, because it opted for trade openness. While in Mercosul, we uh, not always op opted for trade openness, which was the original calling of the bloc, but uh, resorted in many uh, circumstances to uh, speech making uh, and to uh, and even flirted with uh, uh, Mercosul as an instrument to uh, not to integrate to the rest of the world but to isolate from the rest of the world and I can confess here and I can uh, uh, say that with some some pain that uh, Brazil uh, in uh, under previous administrations was uh, part of that misguided conception uh, of Mercosul that Brazil saw, uh, particularly uh, in the period from the early 2000s uh, until uh, 2010, more or less, Brazil saw Mercosul as an instrument to avoid integration uh, to the rest uh, of the world. We uh, used Mercosul, for example, to avoid uh, the uh, idea of the uh, or the project of the free trade area of the Americas, the FTAA, which we can argue would uh, have transformed our economies if we had uh, become a part of that uh, without losing Mercosul identity. Anyway, uh, we do think that free trade is uh, a uh, pillar of Mercosul. The four member countries have uh, always worked for stronger trade and openness among them, as well as for improving their integration at the regional and international levels. At, at least that's what we should uh, have done and what we are doing now. Uh, uh, early on, we uh, took a first step by building a, a network or starting to build a network of free trade agreements uh, within South America. Uh, and in 2019, as the uh, phasing out of tariffs was completed, uh, those efforts uh, culminated in the formation uh, of a free trade area or what, what amounts to a free trade area uh, in South America, with the exception of uh, Guyana and, and Suriname. This uh, is an effort that, uh, this part, not always, not everything was, um, let's say, a, uh, a going away from the original uh, impulse of Mercosul. This 
uh, idea and this uh, reality now of Mercosur as part of a South American integration process uh, is something that, that thrived. Uh, uh, another uh, second step was going uh, beyond South America. Only timid attempts were made uh, for many years with uh, limited uh, scope agreements with uh, uh, India, for example, the Southern African Customs Union, uh, or Israel. But uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we have been finally able to give a new drive to Mercosur's uh, external uh, agenda. Uh, this uh, was totally convergent with uh, our administration, President Bolsonaro's administration uh, approach to uh, not only to Mercosur, but to the, uh, uh, the relationship of Brazil with the rest of the world. Uh, Brazil decided to finally uh, open to the world and uh, to catch up with all the lost opportunities in order to become a key actor uh, in, the in the global supply chains, in the uh, new structure of global trade. Uh, for us, in Brazil, opening, privatization, the bid to join OECD, uh, and other aspects, all that are part of the same drive aimed at uh, changing in, uh, at home, of course, it creates a, a new structure for our engagement with the world, but at home, it's part of uh, a project of uh, changing a, uh, an old uh, governance system, which was uh, unfortunately uh, based on corruption in so many cases, state-centered, uh, prone to uh, uh, mismanagement and uh, conducive to uh, backwardness and deindustrialization. So uh, uh, we uh, started to correct uh, the, the uh, many uh, misguided policies that Brazil had adopted over many years, and Mercosul was part uh, of that new drive. We saw Mercosul as a platform that, from our point of view, could immensely help Brazil in attaining uh, that new project. So uh, with that in mind, and uh, thanks in part to that new drive in Brazil, Mercosul uh, wrapped up free trade negotiations with the EU after 20 years, uh, back in June 2019, and with the European Free Trade Association uh, in August of that year. Uh, these were the first negotiations concluded by, by Mercosul with highly competitive and developed countries. And now we are engaged in, uh, fully engaged in uh, other modern free trade agreements with major partners like Canada, South Korea, and Singapore. Uh, so uh, we have uh, also, uh, we can say that we uh, reclaimed uh, free trade as a key element uh, also uh, in the internal agenda uh, of Mercosul, uh, and not only with the rest uh, of the world. Since uh, the beginning of, uh, from our point of view, of course, I'm, I'm uh, speaking from the point of view of Brazil, we do see the, uh, the drive that we brought to Mercosul uh, as a reason for the uh, progress we made also in the internal uh, integration and not only the outside integration. So uh, we uh, had many, uh, many new uh, initiatives and advances like the uh, approval of a, a, a facilitation, trade facilitation agreement, which was immensely important. Uh, agreements on mutual recognition of uh, geographical indications, um, agreements on electronic trade, uh, and also uh, uh, started to tackle some uh, outstanding issues uh, in the block like sugar and the uh, automotive uh, industry. Uh, another uh, progress that we uh, are proud of, uh, and that comes from uh, uh, previous uh, eras, uh, so to say, of Mercosur, but uh, it's revealing now its usefulness, is the uh, FOSEM, the uh, Structural Convergence Fund, uh, whereby Mercosur has invested more than $1 billion in, in many projects and recently uh, allocated uh, 60, $16 million to uh, the effort of fighting uh, COVID. So uh, uh, basically, uh, and to conclude, uh, Mercosur, uh, as much as we uh, are uh, sentimentally attached to it, like myself. And uh, I uh, remember very fondly that uh, I was not there for the signing of the agreement, but uh, later the same year, 1991, I, uh, my first uh, month as a, as a career diplomat, I worked 
in the uh, first uh, Mercosul summit in Brasilia in December 1991. So uh, uh, in spite of that, that sentimental aspect, which is important, uh, our trade policy, our global insertion uh, in the world, our strategy uh, for development, for uh, prosperity, to bring uh, new opportunities to our peoples, uh, cannot be based only on this sentimental uh, attachment, nor on the deep friendship that exists among our, our peoples and which will always uh, exist. Uh, we must, must go beyond that and build on top of that friendship uh, and, those, and that attachment. Uh, we must generate concrete results. Uh, we must generate uh, opportunities for the people, for the companies, opportunities for uh, our countries to overcome failed uh, models uh, of the past. Uh, Mercosul, and uh, I come back to the beginning, to the third years, uh, to the scenario third years ago, uh, Mercosul is a child uh, of that first moment of globalization. Its first summit, December 1991, was held uh, a few days before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, for example. So we're contemporary to the, this new world that uh, started to open up in the, in the beginning of the 1991. And uh, Mercosul was born under the, the stars that were in the sky at that moment, so to say, the stars of democracy and free trade, uh, of uh, political and economic freedom going hand in hand as the means to uh, human accomplishment and uh, prosperity. Uh, we were not born under the stars of uh, political correctness or techno-totalitarianism uh, as we see today threatening uh, freedom in, uh, in our countries, uh, let, al let alone uh, in uh, an atmosphere where uh, we see uh, narco regimes uh, still unfortunately thriving in our region. This is not what Mercosul was original about or should be. Uh, so uh, today we see looking at the world, at least it's our perspective here in Brazil, that unfortunately the whole world uh, is close to abandoning that dream of the early 90s, that dream of uh, economic and uh, political freedom going hand in hand, that world centered around uh, freedom. And uh, we have the opportunity to revamp that dream, both in the world and inside uh, Mercosul. The, um, the world has uh, let the idea and the sentiment of freedom to be excluded from the center of international discussions. Brazil now wants to help to correct that, be it globally or regionally. Uh, and Mercosul can be a part uh, of this uh, new world with uh, freedom as, at its center. Thank you very much. Minister Araujo, in 2019, after 20 years of negotiations, Mercosur and the European Union finally reached a trade deal, considered one of the most important accords for both blocs. Now, in 2021, what are the prospects and next steps for ratification and implementation? Mr. Minister? Good. Th thank you, Ambassador, for the question. So, uh, for us, uh, we can say that the Mercosur-European Union agreement uh, is a strategic one. Uh, first, it's not uh, a, only a trade agreement, it's an association agreement. It has other aspects, political cooperation. And inside trade, it's not purely uh, an agricultural uh, trade agreement, which uh, would seem from what you hear in, uh, in the European press, for example. Uh, it goes much beyond. Of course, it's industrial trade, but also uh, it deals with investment, with trade facilitation, with services. So uh, from, uh, from us, and I speak for Brazil, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the great added value of the Mercosur European Union Agreement is not uh, market opening in the EU for our products. That's important, but that, that's not the key aspect. The key aspect is to reconnect uh, our uh, pr production, uh, productive sector to uh, key partners uh, in Europe. Uh, Germany, France, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, many European countries are key investors in, in Brazil uh, or in Mercosul. And uh, we uh, know that they can invest much more and uh, the, uh, the competitiveness of their own companies can be increased by the, uh, the agreement. This would help our reindustrialization. This would help immensely in our case to, to uh, go many uh, steps uh, ahead in terms of our technological development, our, our presence in the value chains. So, uh, and, and for Brazil, this, is, uh, this agreement is part uh, of a, a 
what we, since we are in the Atlantic Council, uh, of a reconnection uh, with what we can call uh, with the Atlantic world. Okay, the Atlantic world, not only as a geographic concept, but uh, of this community of democratic uh, and market-oriented nations. So uh, together with the uh, OECD bid that I mentioned, together with our totally new policy towards the United States, with whom uh, Brazil signed uh, some important uh, regulatory uh, trade agreements last, uh, last year. So uh, this is part of a, a strategy, so to say. And today we don't feel that the European side has the same strategic view uh, of the uh, Mercosur European Union agreement, uh, regret, uh, and we re regret that. So we, Mercosur, for 20 years, and especially now in the final phase, uh, we negotiated, we put a lot of effort into, into the negotiations, and we negotiated in good faith. And all European individual countries knew what was being negotiated. So it's not like they learned the contents of the agreement by reading that in the newspaper the day it was we concluded the negotiations. Uh, right? But that's the impression you have, that so suddenly they, they found what's there and, and they, uh, some countries don't, don't like it. But okay, we uh, uh, already signaled from the Mercosur side that we're ready to, uh, to see what they want more. And of course, they, they uh, want to see uh, other kinds of uh, elements in terms of the environment. Okay, And we said we're ready for that. And now uh, we hear that they may not be ready to present what they, they themselves want in terms of additional elements for the environment. So uh, we start to wonder uh, what is the uh, European perspective on, on this agreement. For us, as I said, it's strategic and we're totally ready to work with any new elements, environment or otherwise, and we're here. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister.